We uh, got to finish off caissons disease, which, believe it or not, they ask a lot of questions on. Just like they do high altitude, they ask about people that like to go into water, which amazes me. Why would somebody want to do something like that? For every 30 or 33 feet, depends on who you read, you increase uh, one atmospheric pressure. So in other words, if we're 760 here, it's 760 times 2 when you're down underwater 30 to 33 feet. The reverse is true when you go in high altitude. For example, on the top, top of Mount Everest, the atmospheric pressure is 200. You're still breathing 21% oxygen, which most people don't understand. You're breathing still just like the oxygen we're breathing here, but the atmospheric pressure is less. And you learned uh, the formula from uh, Dr. Passo about how to calculate alveolar oxygen, right? It's uh, 0.21 times what your atmospheric pressure is, right? Minus the PCO2 divided by 0.8. And so uh, you can see right off the bat that 0.21 times 200 is only 42. <laughs> okay. And so uh, you subtract from that, let's say, the normal of 40 for PCO2, 0.8 into 46. I mean, you're talking about maybe 2 millimeters of mercury of, uh, of uh, air in your alveoli. So you can see why you have to hyperventilate at high altitude because as you lower the PCO2, what do you automatically do to the PO2 in your blood? It goes up. You have to hyperventilate, otherwise you die. But when you go under, the atmospheric pressure increases. So um, what happens is the nitrogen gases get dissolved in your tissue at the increased pressure. So if you're down there exploring something underwater, maybe 60, 70 feet, and then some denison from the deep, is starting to come up and just kind of check you out for lunch, okay, you could potentially want to get up fast, you know, and get out of there. And because of that, what happens, like shaking a soda, uh, soda bottle, the gas comes out of, uh, out of the, it, uh, it was dissolved in the fat and stuff like that. It comes out as bubbles. And the bubbles get in your tissue and also in your blood vessels, and they block the blood flow. And that's called the bends. You get tremendous pain. And you can end up with quadriplegia because the little vessels that supply your spinal cord are very susceptible to that. Uh, bladder, loss of bladder control, and eventually you could die from something like that. And so the treatment for that is to put you in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, and uh, hopefully things will get better for you. That's called caisson's disease, or, DO, or uh, I guess that's what they call it, caisson's disease, the key term for that. Okay, nutrition. Eating disorders, they like to ask questions on eating disorders. Uh, it can come under behavioral science, but it also can come under uh, nutrition as well. When we talk about uh, eating disorders, that includes obesity, okay? It also includes your uh, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa. What's the main difference between anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa? Basically, the biggest difference is body image, distorted body image. Women that have anorexia nervosa have, they could be 60 pounds, and they think they're fat. It's very distorted body image. It's a control issue. Basically, they've lost control over everything in their life, okay, except one thing they can control is what they put in their mouth. And I know all about this because my wife had anorexia nervosa, so I'm pretty up on this stuff. And what happens is, you know, as you lose weight, lose 15, 20 percent of your body fat, body weight, uh, your gonadotropin releasing hormone decreases. That means FSH and LH decrease. That means you have low estrogen levels. That means you have no periods. It also means you're going to develop osteoporosis just as if you were postmenopausal. That's the board question right there. Okay, the osteoporosis part of eating disorders, particularly anorexia nervosa. What will eventually happen is you will develop osteoporosis. Okay, and that's what they go as far. That's as far as they go for part one. Part two would ask you what you do about it. Let's say they'll usually use a, uh, a, 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 an Olympic athlete, okay, a woman, let's say, that's a runner or something like that. She has no periods because her body mass is too low for gonadotropin-releasing hormone release. And I say, what do you do? Always think cheap, <laughs> okay? You know, what you do, the answer to the question is you try to convince the person to gain enough weight so that the periods come back. That's the answer. Not birth control pills right off the bat. The answer is to try to to explain to them that they need to gain enough weight to bring their periods back. Always think cheap with the boards, okay? Don't think drugs right off the bat, 
For example, first step in management of hypertension, weight loss. Okay? Not, uh, let's see, thiazides or what's see, or what, you know, forget it. <laughs> you just missed it. Okay? It's weight loss. First step of treatment of type 2 diabetes, weight loss. Because you know as you downregulate, as you uh, lose adipose, you upregulate insulin receptor synthesis, and so oftentimes you can control the hyperglycemia just by pure weight loss. So don't forget the obvious, okay? Think cheap for boards, and you'll get the answers right. So that's anorexia nervosa, some of the key things there. Uh, usually you die of cardiac disease, okay? Heart failure, your heart just stops. I might get pretty close to that, actually. Bulimia nervosa is not a body image problem. They don't have to be thin. They can be obese. They can be normal weight. They can be thin. So there's no weight type of thing with bulimia. They don't have a distorted body, a distorted body image, but they binge. They eat a lot, and then they force vomit. Okay? You end up with this picture's been on boards. I know what I forgot to do. I knew, where's anyone who's, I, I need the, a new one of these things who are batteries in this. Because I, I knew I sh this was running out yesterday, and I should have. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. There was stuff in here, but I need another one anyway. <laughs> I had this in my ear, and it was wax in there. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> you probably said, now you blows up your nose, and it was a booger in there, right? Okay. But at any rate, um, this picture's been on boards because he wants you to be able to recognize what enamel looks like. Uh, from the vomiting, the acid will wear down the amyl, uh, enamel, and you'll end up with just dentine showing. So that browner stuff is dentine. That's with all the enamel go. Those are the erosions that you get in the, uh, on the teeth. They want you to know stuff like that. Also, what the metabolic abnormality would you expect if you force vomit? Metabolic alkalosis. Of course, that's a very bad acid-base disorder because alkalosis less shifts your curve. And, uh, oops, and the compensation is respiratory acidosis that drops your PO2. So you really develop hypoxia when you have metabolic alkalosis, and hearts don't like that. So a heart with tissue hypoxia oftentimes throws off some uh, premature ventricular contractions. You have an R on T phenomenon. You go into V-fib, and you're dead. And so metabolic alkalosis is very dangerous for inducing cardiac arrhythmias, and that commonly occurs in patients that have bulimia to get metabolic alkalosis from the forced vomiting. Another thing they can get is they can vomit up blood, and that could either be Mallory Weiss, where they have a tear in a distal esophagus, proximal stomach, or even worse than that, Borhan syndrome, they actually have a rupture, and an air and secretions from the esophagus get into a pleural cavity. The air can dissect through the subcutaneous tissue, come around into your intermediate sternum, and you get Hyman's crunch, which was asked on boards. They described some young lady. And that when they, they said when you put the stethoscope on the chest, there was kind of a crunching sound there, Hammond's crunch. They won't say Hammond's crunch, but that's what it is. That's basically air that is dissected up into the interstitial tissue and into your mediastinum. And it means you ruptured your esophagus. And Borhoff syndrome is very common in bulimics. So that's another one that they common there. So the two things on bulimia you want to remember is the vomiting, metabolic alkalosis, which can induce arrhythmias, and Borhoff syndrome. Those are the key ones they hone in on. Remember now on uh, obesity, we are using a different method. It's not just, you know, finding you on a chart, you know, your, your weight and all that stuff and height and all that. Now they use body mass index, okay, and it's uh, the kilograms over meter, kilograms of body weight divided by meters and height squared, okay, and the magic number is 30. If your BMI is 30 or greater, you're obese. If you're 40 or greater, you're morbidly obese. So now they use basal uh, body mass index uh, for defining obesity, not, you know, these little charts like they get in the uh, insurance companies. It seems to follow pretty good for, uh, uh, for defining these patients. What do you think is the main um, complication of obesity? Now, the answer is hypertension. Hypertension is probably one of the biggest things that you get related to uh, obesity. They, the actual mechanism is not fully understood, but uh, hypertension commonly occurs. And if you have hypertension, it can get left ventricular hypertrophy, and eventually you do run the risk of heart failure if you have left ventricular hypertrophy, because you know that cardiac disease is the most common cause of death in hypertension. But there's many other things that you know about gallbladder disease, right? Cancers, 
Because remember, if you have a lot of adipose, then you, it means you aromatize. I hope you know for me what that term aromatase. You aromatize a lot of 17 keto steroids like androstenedione uh, into uh, what? Estrogens. And so if you have hyperestrogenism, and all women that are obese have hyperestrogenism, then what risk do you have? Thank you so much. You have estrogen-related cancers. And they include uh, things like breast cancer, endometrial adenocarcinoma, and then other ones that they more commonly get are colon cancer, all kinds of cancers. Okay, are associated also with obesity as well. And I think that's about all we need to mention on obesity. Turns out the United States is one of the top countries in the world for obesity. Okay, so that's pretty cool. You saw this slide before, but I want to uh, go a little bit further. Remember, this was the little dude that had what? Quashior cord and what does this have? Marasmus, okay? Marasmus is total calorie deprivation. They don't have enough calories. And so they have wasting away of their muscle. That's probably the biggest thing. But they have a really good chance of survival if they get food. Notice that this kid looks very like he's ready to get up and eat. Okay, now this little dude over here is probably going to die. They have a total number of calories is okay, but it's all carbs. And they're missing protein. They also have anemias. They also have cellular immunity problems. In other words, when you skin test them for their ability to react to candida or, or mumps or something like that, they show no reaction and indicates that they that their uh, cellular immunity is defective, okay? They have the low albumin levels, ascites, they have fatty livers. So those kids uh, are very, very sick, and they very frequently die. They're apathetic, you have to force-feed them. So the little dudes that have quashior core are more likely to, to die than those with marasmus. This kid uh, has a couple things that you can clearly see. The kid has, a, has edema of the legs, you can see that. You can see the flaky paint dermatitis, looks like the paint's peeling off off of the, the, their skin there. Notice the flag sign, have reddish hair, that's due to copper deficiency. So all of these are features of quashua core. Okay, in, when you integrate in things in medicine, you should always uh, ask yourself questions like, when you have vitamins, is fat and is water soluble? Okay, you should, you should be able to right now, if you really understand nutrition, be able to say, well, what are the differences between fat and water, water soluble? Well, one obvious one is that fat soluble means that it dissolves in fat. So it means that it's taken up by chylomicrons. Okay? That's one of the features of the chylomicron is going to have A, D, E, and K in there because they are fat soluble vitamins. Okay? That's one obvious difference, whereas water soluble or water soluble. Okay? Another obvious uh, difference is, is that if it's fat soluble, it's more likely to be stored in fat, and so therefore toxicities are much greater, or greater chance of toxicity with a fat-soluble vitamin than a water, because if it's water-soluble, you pee it out. It's said in this country, we have the most expensive pee in the world, because okay, of peeing out all those, all those water-soluble vitamins, we think. You know, in America, we think if one works, then ten works better. Okay, and so we basically, hype, we, we over-vitaminize ourselves, if there is such a word. And with all those water solubles, that's why you have such nice orange urine all the time. Okay, that ain't, that ain't jaundice. Okay, that ain't bilirubin in there. That's the, that's the pigments from the pills that you take. In fact, some people, I mean, I remember even reading in some internal medicine thing, the most common cause of bright yellow urine is someone taking vitamins. Okay. So we have very expensive urine and also very expensive poo because most of the vitamins are worthless and they never break down and you end up in your stool anyway. Total waste of money. Okay. So those are obvious differences there, but there's even more than that. Water-soluble vitamins are all cofactors for biochemical reactions. And since you haven't had biochemistry, I can't have fun with you today because then you would be totally de-edified, okay, uh, because it, it's big-time biochemistry. And uh, since I like biochemistry, all the biochemical correlations that you need to know on nutrition are there, okay. So we'll just kind of hang low a little bit on the I'm really going in-depth into this, and I suggest strongly that after Hansen talks to you, uh, that you read the nutrition chapter again, and you'll get a lot more biochemistry points uh, by doing that. Okay, A lot of what she says will make a little bit more sense, because right now some of you, just not right there where you should be with biochemistry, you haven't had it yet. Some of you haven't had it for years, so I can understand that. So all water-soluble vitamins are, are cofactors of biochemical reactions. Not so with fat-soluble vitamins. They have a, another life 
other than being a cofactor for a biochemical reaction. So there's a major difference there as well. Okay, some of you are experts in physical diagnosis, especially if you're British trained. And so you'd look at this eye and you'd see this kind of area of squamous metaplasia, the bit hot spot, so you know it's vitamin A deficiency. And you can see these little what look like goosebumps in the back of the arm there. That's follicular hyperkeratosis. These are signs, of course, of vitamin A deficiency. So let's talk about A. What does it do? Very important. Vitamin A is very important in the growth of children. Okay, the uh, bone growth and, and muscle growth. So it's very important in children for growth. And you can have failure to thrive with vitamin A deficiency. Don't forget that. Also, you know about the visual purple in the eye, iodopsin, rhodopsin. In fact, the first sign of vitamin A deficiency is night blindness, which is called nyctalopia. So it's involved in that. And here's another big one. It prevents squamous metaplasia. That's kind of interesting. Prevents it. Okay, so that you don't undergo squamous metaplasia. And that's, of course, what's happening here. The eye is, uh, is lined by a low cuboidal epithelium. And if you get squamous metaplasia, then you form these little white spots here. And if these become very extensive, they can grow over the eye. You get a softening of the cornea. That's called keratomalation. You go blind. It's probably number two cause of global blindness is vitamin A deficiency. Now, the first cause of global blindness is trachoma. Now, in this country, uh, diabetes mellitus is the most common cause of blindness. But worldwide, it's trachoma, chlamydia trachomatis, and right after, it's vitamin A deficiency from keratomalacia. Okay, lose your sight. So that's another feature of vitamin A. It's involved in, in uh, preventing squamous metaplasia. So in other words, you could be a non-smoker, and you can get squamous metaplasia of your main stem bronchus, and as some people say bronchogenic carcinoma. Okay, so it, it, it affects uh, that as well. Very, very important concept. So that's the, that's the deficiency part of it. Now, they, they are into every single one of the vitamins that are fat-soluble, they ask questions on hypervitaminosis because so many people take too much. Okay, so a very favorite one for hypervitaminosis A is the big game hunter who eats bear liver, okay? So if they say bears, they say big game hunter, and they talk about headaches, what they're talking about is the, they get cerebral edema from increase in vitamin A, from hypervitaminosis A. They get cerebral edema with papal edema, of course, that's going to produce headache. You can herniate and die. Also, you already know that retinoic acid, which is used for treating acne and also for treating uh, acute progranulocytic leukemia, uh, vitamin A toxicity not only can produce intracerebral edema, but also can produce severe liver toxicity. So uh, hypervitaminosis A affects two main areas. One is the brain. That's the more common one, cerebral edema. And the second area is your liver. So if you've got a young lady on isotretinoic acid for cystic acne, you've got to be checking out her liver enzymes every now and then and checking her out for, you know, whether she has any uh, headaches and stuff like that. She could be developing papal edema and cerebral edema related to vitamin A toxicity. So that's the big one that they ask on that one uh, on boards. Usually the big game hunter who has headaches, and then you have to explain why that is. He ate the bear. So in other words, the bear eventually got back. The hunter killed the bear... The hunter said, me hunter, I eat liver, kind of like Hannibal, you know. Me hunter, I eat brain, you know, that kind of stuff. Ooh. Uh, I've never watched that movie. But uh, uh, the bear gets back because a, that's where we store vitamin A, and there's massive amounts of vitamin A in bear livers, okay? And so the bear gets back, even though it's dead, the hunter dies, okay, with uh, severe headaches or liver failure. It's cool. I think that's good, right? D is big time. Oh, vitamin D deficiency, big, 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 big time. Okay? This kind of surprised me. I thought the most common uh, uh, source of vitamin D was what you ate. Uh, that was wrong. The most common source is when you went outside. Okay? And that's uh, the uh, sunlight. Okay? Remember that, you know, we always talk about cholesterol as something bad. Oh, cholesterol is bad, bad. Not really. <laughs> I mean, cholesterol is the main component of our cell membranes. Is that bad? No. Uh, cholesterol is the, um, the starting point for making bile salts and bile acids. Is that bad? No. Uh, cholesterol is the first compound that starts the synthesis of the steroid hormones in the adrenal cortex. Is that bad? No. 
And it's seven-day hydrocholesterol that's in your skin that gets photoconverted into vitamin D. Is that bad? No. So we need cholesterol. Okay, it makes bile salts, it makes hormones. Okay, it makes this vitamin, vitamin D, cell membranes, good Lord in heaven. We need cholesterol. So it's not all that bad. So sunshine actually is the most important uh, way we get vitamin D. You don't think you get it from breast milk, do you? You don't hardly have any vitamin D in breast milk. You don't have, hardly have any vitamin K in your breast milk. That's why that has to be supplemented. Okay, so that's why you have to take your baby out. Make sure it's exposed to sunlight. It just takes a little bit of exposure and there's a, the vitamin D synthesis occur. Now, I don't mean you take them out in the middle, you know, in the, in the winter, you know, when it's, uh, it's sub-zero weather. You little dudes naked and you're holding them up to the sun like this, you know, because they're going to take you in. They're going to bring you in and they're going to arrest you. Okay, but you probably say, but Dr. Goyang said my baby needed to get vitamin D. And I'm just making sure my little dude gets it. All right, that's not right. That's not what I said. Just a little exposure is fine. And don't stick them on a rotisserie with duct tape and turn them around like this, okay? You know, to kind of make an even tan on a little dude. Okay, that's not a cool idea either. Got to protect the little dudes. So sunshine diet. Remember, it gets reabsorbed in your jejunum, actually. And it has to go undergo two hydroxylation steps. The first one's in the liver, where it's 25 hydroxylated. And then the second one's in the kidney, okay? And that's one hydroxylated. So that's a one alpha hydroxylase. Who can tell me what hormone puts it there in the proximal tubule? PTH does, parathormone. Actually, it's responsible for the synthesis of one alpha hydroxylase. And even ask on boards where it's located. And the answer to that is the proximal tubule. So you've got to know where these different things are. Angiotensin converting enzyme, endothelial cells in the pulmonary capillaries, erythropoietin endothelial cells in the peritubular capillaries, 1-alpha-hydroxylase, proximal tubules. That's where it's synthesized. And that puts the second hydroxylation step on, and now you have active vitamin D. Okay, now it works. And what does it do? Well, vitamin D reabsorbs calcium and phosphorus from the jejunum. That's its main function. It has to reabsorb both of those. Why do you think that's true? Because what's its main job? Mineralizing bone and cartilage. That's its main job. And remember, you have to have an appropriate solubility product to be able to do that, don't you? And so calcium and phosphorus are necessary to mineralize cartilage and mineralize bone. Okay, like the osteoid to make bone. And so you would, it makes sense that it would reabsorb calcium and phosphorus because it needs to make sure that both of those are present in adequate amounts to have an adequate solubility product to mineralize it, which is what its main job is doing. Okay, so that should, that should be understandable from that. We should talk a little bit about parathormone now while we've got, since parathormone is somewhat related to vitamin D metabolism and that it, it helped its last hydroxylation step. Uh, parathormone, as you recall, uh, you get reabsorption of calcium mainly from your right where your thiazides block uh, your thiazides block uh, uh, sodium reabsorption that early part of the distal tubule right there is where uh, there's a channel a calcium channel that parathermone helps in the reabsorption of calcium except that calcium has to kind of take turns with sodium and so most of the time a sodium is being reabsorbed out of that, and calcium saying, my turn? No, I'm more of me than you. And so most of the time, well, calcium just has to wait and then sneak into that channel when it gets a chance with the help of parathormone getting it reabsorbed. And so you can easily understand, and I hope our, 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 our fake from England taught you that when you're on thiazides, and you block sodium reabsorption, that leaves the channel open totally for calcium. That's why hypercalcemia is a potential complication of thiazides. Of course, he told you that, because I know the man from England, okay, probably told you that, right? So you can run into that risk, right? So what would you use it for in therapy then? Calcium stone formers. Okay, calcium stone formers, because the majority of calcium stone formers have hypercalciuria. That's a board question. That's the most common metabolic abnormality in calcium stone form. They have too much calcium in their urine. Why? Because they reabsorb too much calcium from their gut. That's why. And so they put them on hydrochlorothiazide to suck the calcium out of their urine. Okay? So that they, uh, they don't form stones again. Just gave you a couple more pharmacology points. I just thought I'd mention that to you. 
So it reabsorbs calcium in that location in the nephron. It decreases the reabsorption of phosphorus in the proximal tubule. And bicarbonate decreases actually the, re the reclamation of bicarbonate uh, there. So that's what its main functions are. Also, as I said, makes one alpha hydroxylase in the proximal tubules and helps vitamin D get that second hydroxylation. This is very important, and you don't see this in too many books. Uh, Cecil's probably has the best section on this because I think the other ones don't want to deal with it because it's kind of hard. And that is how vitamin D and parathermone work together. Well, we know that, that vitamin D's main function is mineralizing bone. That's its main function. And so we know that osteoblasts are involved in that particular function. Okay? And it would be logical that the receptor for vitamin D would be located on the osteoblast, and in fact it is, okay? And when it hooks into its receptor there, it causes the release of an enzyme. You should be able to tell me what that enzyme is. What is it? It's alkaline phosphatase, guys. So whenever you're growing bone, or, or you know, you're making bone from a fracture, you know you have a fracture and you're rehealing that fracture, you expect to see an increase in alkaline phosphatase because vitamin D would be hooking into that osteoblast, and that would be releasing alkaline phosphatase, which actually makes the appropriate solubility product to mineralize cartilage and bone. Okay? Now, you would think, knowing that parathermone breaks down bone and kind of helps maintain your, your calcium levels in your bloodstream, you would think that its receptor would be on the osteoclast, because that's the, thing, the cell that normally breaks bone down as an osteoclast. It ain't, though. There's only one hormone that has a receptor on an osteoclast, and what, do you, what is it? Calcitonin. And we know that when calcitonin hooks into an osteoclast receptor there, it inhibits the osteoclast, and that's why it's used in treating hypercalcemia. Okay, also used in uh, treating osteoporosis as well, as you know. Well, but there isn't a receptor there on osteoclast for parathermal. It's actually on the osteoblast. Which really threw me. I defy you to find that in most books except Cecil, maybe a few other areas. Okay, it's been documented. It's on the osteoblast. Not, not sharing the same one as vitamin D, but very interesting that when it hooks into its receptor on the osteoblast, it releases interleukin-1. Now, another name for interleukin-1 actually is osteoclast activating factor. Isn't that interesting? It has another name. I mean, it's, I mean, here's this dude that helps us with fever and, and stimulates antibody synthesis and B cell stimulation. It's got so many different functions. But one of its big functions is that it can activate osteoclasts. Okay? And so it's the interleukin-1 released from the, re, uh, from the, uh, uh, the osteoblast uh, when parathermone hooks into its receptor that stimulates the osteoclast to break down bone and maintain our calcium levels in our bloodstream. Okay, see how that works? That seems like a pretty important function, doesn't it? Is there a check on that interleukin-1? Sure, it's called our sex hormones. For you women, it's your estrogen levels. I keep a check on interleukin-1 so it doesn't go too hog wild and break down, cause too much osteoclast activation. For us guys, it's testosterone, which kind of puts an inhibitory effect on on that release of interleukin-1 from the osteoblast after parathermone hooks in there. And so you can see women, how, why you get osteoporosis when you lack estrogen, is that when you lack estrogen, an interleukin-1 osteoclast activating factor is not checked, and you're taking, you're breaking more bone down than you're putting in. And that's the mechanism of osteoporosis in a postmenopausal woman, breaking more bone down than you're making. That's the mechanism. That's a board question right there. That's how it works. Okay, it's very hard to find all that information in between the lines and all that stuff, but look, look Cecil's the more, most recent edition has the best rendition of that, and I just gave it to you. So you can see how parathermone kind of works in there. So they're kind of both working in, with calcium uh, metabolism. Parathermone a little bit more in relationship to maintaining our, our calcium levels in our blood, Vitamin D, a little bit more concentrated on uh, mineralizing bone and cartilage. That's its main function. Okay. Um, when, um, what was I going to say now? Oh, when you have vitamin D deficiency, uh, there could be a lot of reasons for that. You can just look up here. You can see them all up here. Lack of sunshine. Yeah, that's a cause a lot of times in Britain. They don't have a whole lot of sunshine there, and they get vitamin D for the deficiency quite commonly there. Related to that, uh, you can get it from poor diet. 
Okay? You can get it from liver disease. One <coughs> had a trick board question. <clears throat> they said a patient had, um, was on phenytoin for whatever, and so they said the patient had hypocalcemia. They wanted to know why. Tell me. Trick question. What does phenytoin, alcohol, barbiturates, rifampin, all have in common in the liver, guys? It induces the cytochrome P450 system, which is located in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So you get smooth endoplasmic reticulum hyperplasia. So that means you metabolize drugs and other things that are made in the liver, which includes 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And so alcohol, phenytoin, rifampin, barbiturates, anything that revs up that cytochrome P450 system will cause a decrease in vitamin D as well as uh, drugs that you're giving the patient or whatever. That is big time boards. Big time. Uh, another offshoot of that question was you have a woman that was on phenytoin and birth control pills and she got pregnant. Why? Well, the answer was the phenytoin revved up the system and increased the metabolism of the estrogen and progesterone in the birth control pills so she had, didn't have significant enough levels to prevent her from getting pregnant. So they did, they did that particular question, that concept, in relationship to vitamin D deficiency, and I did that particular concept in relationship to uh, birth control pills. There's also an enzyme that's in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which will always be increased in synthesis when you have revved it up. Name me. Oh, we got you. Gamma glutamyl transferase. Gamma glutamyl transferase is the enzyme of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So when that, that system is revved up by drugs, you have an increase in gamma glutamyl transferase. That's one of the key tra tests for picking up an alcoholic, guys. It's gamma glutamyl transferase. Big time. Okay, so liver disease can do it. You can have cirrhosis, but you can't hydroxylate it, or you can have a, a drug that revs up the system and it increases the removal and metabolism of But the most common one is renal disease. And what's the most common cause of chronic renal disease in the United States? Diabetes mellitus. You can see why that is, right? I mean, you've got tubular damage, no one alpha hydroxylase, voila, can't make, you, you know, you have inactive vitamin D. No problem with that understanding of that. So all people that have chronic renal failure are put on uh, 125 uh, vitamin D, which is not what you get in the, in the store. <laughs> okay, would be a great board question. And I think it's just waiting to happen if it already hasn't happened. And that would be, you know, what would be the what would be the steps that would uh, the uh, that would uh, let's see how would I word this thing? I just off the bat. If someone gets over the counter vitamin D, what steps would it go through before it was metabolically active? And they can have A, B, C, D, E, whatever. Uh, okay, and the answer would be you'd have to get um, 25 hydroxylated uh, in your liver, and it has to get one, you know one hydroxylated in your in your kidney. It has to go through the whole thing. It's not 125 vitamin D. It's not. That, that's a prescription drug, and it's extremely dangerous. Okay? So a lot of people have that misconception that it automatically is working and functioning. Oh, no, no, no. You have to have a functioning liver and kidney for that to work. Isn't that a great question? Just got boards written all over it. Got boards written all over it. Okay. Well, you all know that if you have vitamin D deficiency and you're in a kid, they call that rickets. If you have vitamin D deficiency in an adult, we call it osteomalacia, which means soft bones. If you can't mineralize bone, you can't mineralize cartilage, then they're soft, which means that they're easy to fracture. So pathologic fractures are very common. Kids have a few things that are different in, their, in rickets than we see in adults. One is cranial tabes. They have very, very soft skulls. You can actually... Uh, press in on their skulls and it'll kind of recoil like a ping pong ball. That's called cranial tabes. I mean, you can press forever on an adult skull and nothing's going to happen. So don't be there with the patient there. Be pressing on, a, on an adult. Now, what are you doing to my head? I'm trying to see if there's a recoil here. Okay? I mean, they're going to just drag you out, okay, and, and just kind of uh, disbar you. <laughs> okay? So this guy was looking for cranial tabes in an adult. I mean, that would be terrible. Okay. That's not going to happen. So that's different. Second, they can get uh, rachitic rosaries. Because of the fact that uh, that's where osteoid is located in those costochondral junctions, and because they're vitamin D deficient, there's lots of normal osteoid there waiting to be mineralized, but 
but there's no, uh, there's not an appropriate calcium phosphorus uh, solubility product. And so you get this excess of osteoid in that area that looks like little bumps, okay, and they call it rachitic rosary. We don't see that in adults because everything's fused in us, so we don't get to see that. So those things are different in kids than in adults. They have cranial tobies and they have rachitic rosary. Otherwise, the rest of it's the same, pathologic fractures uh, being the big one. Let's see, anything else on vitamin D? Hypervitaminosis D, they've asked. And so, of course, that could be hypercalcemia. And then you run the risk for having more calcium in your urine. Voila. Stones. There you go. Stones. That would be the most common complication. I've got a little chart in there. They don't usually ask questions on um, type 1 vitamin D-dependent rickets, type 2 vitamin D-dependent rickets. But just in case they did, I have the information that you need vitamin. Type 1 is where you're missing the 1-alpha hydroxylase. That's type 1, vitamin D-dependent rickets. And type 2 is where you're missing the receptor for vitamin D. That's basically the difference. Vitamin E. That was a while there, about a year ago, I guess this article came out. It says, no bogus. Vitamin E doesn't do what it says it does. Boy, they ought to take people like that and hang them up by you know what. What? Your toes. What do you think I was talking about? Um... Bad science. Bad science. Okay? Okay. What is vitamin E's main function? To maintain your cell membranes. Prevent lipid peroxidation of your cell membranes. Okay, so in other words, it kind of protects your cell membranes from getting broken down by phospholipase A. That's basically what it does, and they call that lipid peroxidation. That's free radical damage to your cell membranes. Vitamin E prevents that. That's its main function. Its other function is it also can neutralize oxidized LDL, which is far more atherogenic than just LDL by itself. When you oxidize it, that makes it way more injurious to the patient than if it's not oxidized, and vitamin E will neutralize that. I saw in your... Uh, and Hansen put down that vitamin E and vitamin C uh, both um, uh, neutralize oxidized LDL, but most people don't have that down there. I think it's a smooth point. But definitely, unequivocally, vitamin E uh, does neutralize oxidized LDL. Therefore, it is cardioprotective in that regard. So it protects our cell membranes from getting free radical damage. And secondly, it neutralizes oxidized LDL, which is... That's the LDL that macrophages will phagocytose, and then they become foam cells, which is part of the atherosclerotic process, as you're aware. So those are its main functions. Now, uh, can you be deficient in vitamin A? Yes, but it's very uncommon. If we see it, we see it in kids with cystic fibrosis. And I think you could probably figure out why that is. Because right pretty much from birth, kids with cystic fibrosis not only have their respiratory problems, but you saw that poor pancreas and that little dude. Actually, I took that picture on an autopsy, uh, which is very similar, apparently, when uh, some students saw that picture up there, and they said, hey, that was the one that was on our boards. I said, no, it wasn't on your boards because I took the picture. Okay, so it looked just like it. And there is one in uh, Robbins, too. That's pretty similar, and I, hopefully you've got that other sheet of paper. I went all the way through the sixth edition of Robbins and uh, told you where to look at what pictures that I thought was something you might want to look at just before you get into the test and put a little, little, uh, little explanation next to each one of them. So that's so everyone's always there. What about pictures? What about pictures? Okay. If you want about pictures, I wrote them all out for you. You know, go to just follow, just follow the little dictionary there, and you can go right through the sixth edition of uh, Robbins which is a total waste of time, but if you want to do it, go ahead. But I remember there was a picture similar to the one I had in Robbins on that. So they get malabsorption. And you all know, this was a part two board question, multiple, select four it was, and they had all the vitamins down there. They said, select four, you have a child with cystic fibrosis, what vitamin supplements which you're going to give? Duh! <laughs> that was easy. Okay, so if they have malabsorption of fat, then they're going to have malabsorption of the fat-soluble vitamins. So the answer was A, D, E, K. Whoa! That was so hard. <laughs> no, it wasn't. So if you're going to see vitamin E deficiency in this country, you'll be in cystic fibrosis patients. And I just told you that it maintains the integrity of your cell membranes. 
And so one of the features of vitamin E deficiency is a hemolytic anemia. Because if you, if, if, if you, if it's susceptible now to free radical damage and you damage that membrane of the red blood cell, you're going to get a hemolytic anemia. It's going to hemolyze. And so that's one of the features. The other feature is things related to, uh, myelin. They can get posterior column disease. You can get, uh, spinal cerebellar types of disease. So they have neurological problems and a hemolytic anemia with vitamin E deficiency. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Some students said, Dr. Goyan, I had my test, I had something to do with vitamin E toxicity and what it did. I said, what? Vitamin E toxicity? So, what did I do? I looked it up in my notes, <laughs> which apparently I didn't read. And there it was. I just never really paid attention to it. Vitamin E toxicity, by the way, it's defined as any more, anything more than about 1,100 units. It's not a whole lot, guys. The average uh, capsule is 400. So most people take two, three. You're taking three, you're already toxic. You know what it does, vitamin, a, vitamin E toxicity? It prevents the synthesis of the vitamin K-dependent coagulation factors. That's 2, 7, 9, 10, protein C, and protein S. In other words, you're anticoagulated. Now, if you put that into the context, you'd say, but that was still not a good question. Oh, yeah, it's a great question. Because I know if I was somebody that had a myocardial infarction and I made it, I'm going to be thanking God, which you should do anyway, whether you don't have a myocardial infarction or not. But, you know, I'd be thanking God and I'd be making sure that I wouldn't be a couch potato, that I would be taking my antioxidants, Okay, and they all know ACE, ACE hardware, you know, they're going to take my antioxidants and my aspirin one a day, and I'm going to be okay. But as you know, if you have an anterior MI, uh, they very frequently anticoagulate you, and so you go home on three months of warfarin. There's the trick, right there. You go home on three months of warfarin, and so there you go, you're on your warfarin, got your little normal INR ratio, international normalized ratio, then you go to the drugstore and get your vitamin E. And A, and C. And if one works, ten works better. Okay? And so you take lots and lots of vitamin E, thinking that antioxidant, antioxidant, I'm helping myself. No, you're helping warfarin. And so what happens is you over-anticoagulate yourself now. Remember, warfarin blocks gamma, gamma globoxylation of the vitamin K-dependent factors. And now, vitamin E toxicity prevents the synthesis of the stinking factors. And so it's synergistic in activity with warfarin. You learned about that concept from, uh, from Trevor. He told you about certain drugs, and you've got to be careful, actually enhance the activities, and some of them actually inhibit the activities. You need to be careful of that. And so all of a sudden, what you're going to say, I can just see the board question. I can just say it. And I can say, this guy's on warfarin. He's come home from a myocardial infarction, and he's taken the appropriate amount, and his INR ratio is off the map. And he says, I swear, I swear I'm taking a warfarin just like you told me. I don't understand why it, why it went like that. I can tell you why he's taking too much vitamin E. That's the board question you watch. If they already ask what it does, then the next thing will be using it in a clinical context. And that's the clinical context you want to know. So in other words, it anticoagulates you. It's as if you're on warfarin, except it's a different mechanism for the knocking off of the vitamin K dependent factors. You just don't synthesize them. Very interesting. Okay, vitamin K is another very poorly understood, and I remember seeing a lot of little questions that students have told me that they had on their exam. They said, no, vitamin K, <laughs> exclamation mark, exclamation mark, parenthesis, I wish I did, close parenthesis. <laughs> okay, so let's make sure you know vitamin K. Vitamin K can come from what we eat, but most of it's synthesized by our colonic bacteria. That's where most of vitamin K comes from. Our anaerobes and our gut. See, that explains why we would give vitamin K injections to our babies at the moment they're born. Because they only have about three days worth uh, from, uh, from the hookup to mommy when they were in utero. And in about three days, they don't have, can have any vitamin K. Uh, mainly because they, uh, it ain't in breast milk. Okay, so they have a very low level of vitamin K between day three and five. 
and they don't have any bacteria in their gut to make the vitamin K. See, it's a danger time. That's why they can get hemorrhagic disease in the newborn during that time, get blood, blood, brains, uh, uh, bleeds in the brain and die. So we give our kids here in this country vitamin K shot right at, right at birth to, to, to help them. Okay, so since most of it is made by bacteria from the, uh, from the colon. After five days, usually they're colonized, and then they make their own vitamin K, and then there's no problem anymore. All of that's board question stuff, guys. All of that's board question. Okay, now the bacteria uh, make a vitamin K in inactive form. It's called K2, kind of like that mountain over there in uh, uh, the Himalayas. K2, the one. I'm going to climb K2. Good for you. I'm going to climb K1. Okay, there's a K2. There must be a K1, right? Okay. There's the first Baptist church, there must be a second Baptist church. And if there's a second, there must be a third. And if there's a third, there must be a fourth. You know, it can keep on going. That's why I say that I'm in 153rd Baptist church. There you go. All those different numbers. Okay. So K2 is inactive and it has to be converted into K1, which is the active form. Well, there's an enzyme that does that. It's called the epoxide reductase. Kind of sounds like epoxy glue. That's close enough. You can then be epoxy glue. And I think you'd be able to remember epoxide. Okay, it'll just come back. Just like Casper the Friendly Ghost, caspasasis. That's close enough. You're going to be able to get anything on the test related to it. So you have to have that enzyme, epoxide reductase, to convert the inactive K2 to K1. What does K1 do? It gamma carboxylates the vitamin K-dependent factors, 2, 7, 9, 10, protein, CNS. We do that when we do coagulation. We'll go through those factors and stuff like that. Now, it's, gamma carboxylation is kind of similar to, you know, your understanding of vitamin C. It hydroxylates proline and lysine. Nice. So what? Well, you found out. So what? You found out if you did not hydroxylate proline and lysine, then uh, the cross links that would make the collagen fibril stronger are not going to be there. And so it's weak. So that was something. You know, there's a similar analogy here. Gamma carboxylation of those vitamin K-dependent factors actually activates them so that they are functional, okay? The vitamin K-dependent factors have something all in common, okay? One is that they have to be activated by vitamin K1, but the other thing is they're the only coagulation factors that are bound to a clot by calcium. So they have to be bound by calcium in order to work in forming a clot. If, if, you, if, if, you, if you can't bind them, then you're anticoagulated. Well, guess what gamma carboxylation does? It's the glutamic acid residues that get gamma carboxylated on the vitamin K dependent factors. Vitamin K1 does that, and it allows calcium to bind those factors. And so it keeps them together, and so you're able to form a clot. So if you don't gamma carboxylate them, then they're basically useless, because calcium can't grab them to help in the formation of a clot. Okay, do you understand that? So that's the importance of it. So it's kind of similar. It's kind of an anchor point, in this case, for calcium. In the case of hydroxylating proline and lysine, an anchor point for putting a cross bridge, bridge in for binding. Do you understand? So it's a similar concept there. Well, you'll probably, probably figure out what warfarin does. It inhibits epoxide reductase. I mean, Trevor taught you that. We well, might have just used the term reductase. Okay, but that's what it does. It blocks it, so that means that all the vitamin K we have is K2, and we can't gamma carboxylate anything, and so therefore the patient's anticoagulated. Understand that? Very important that you got that. Very, very important. Okay, there's lots of ways we can get vitamin K deficiency. How about broad spectrum antibiotics? That's the most common cause in a hospital, actually. You just annihilate and sterilize the patient's bowel, and you kill those dudes that are making our vitamin K. So that's a common one right there, all right? Secondly, poor diets, being a newborn, you can malabsorb it because it is a fat-soluble vitamin, okay? Those kinds of things, all right. If you're deficient in vitamin K, you have a hemorrhagic diathesis, meaning you get bleeding, okay? It could be into your brain, into your skin, uh, because you're anticoagulated, okay? You all know that also. Now, there's a couple little scenarios that are very interesting. They have good ones for the vitamin K. One, you have to know what the, why the newborn gets vitamin K deficiency. One was pushing it a little bit. They talked about, I think it was a six-day-old six child was being breastfed and then had a bleeding diathesis. 
and they wanted to know why that was. The answer was uh, there wasn't enough vitamin K in breast milk, and so the kid was vitamin K deficient. That was pushing it because, you know, that's about the time that the bacterial colonization occurs, but that's the way they asked it. Okay, so that was one they asked. The other one was a kid that ate rat poison. Uh, rat poison is warfarin, okay, and rats eat it, and then they get anticoagulated and die. That was one. And they also asked how you treated it. Um, the answer to that is you treat it with intramuscular vitamin K. And another uh, cool one was is that a kid lived with his grandparents uh, who were elderly and developed a hemorrhagic diathesis. Why? The answer is, and they don't tell you that the uh, elderly people want warfarin. The answer was when they put down the clinical scenarios is that the kid got a hold of some of the uh, warfarin from the uh, from the uh, their grandparent, ate it, and um, and uh, was uh, at toxic levels. So and then it was anticoagulated. So there's a lot of little tricky questions on vitamin K. Okay, let's break.